everyone, it's Jack from Cultaholic.com and I'm joined by Joe Hendry. Hello, Hello, Jack. We've known each other for quite a while now, actually. We have indeed, we have indeed. What a magical few years it's been. I know, it's been a long time. It, it feels like it was yesterday, but it's been, that's coming up three years now. Three years or three so, Three years, yeah. wow. It's crazy. Um, so the aim of today's show, I guess, or today's video, is how to become a pro wrestler with yes. Joe Hendry. I'm not personally looking to break into the business, that's... I'm far too cowardly. You've been there and you've done it. You've won I've, titles. I've paid my dues. Yeah, yeah you've you've won uh, one of those titles. You've won twice as many times as me, I believe. The DDT Ironman Heavy Metal true. Weight that is true. Championship. Yes, it still bothers me. Still bothers um, me. You forfeited it. You dropped it into it. Yeah, bin. I did. It's a strange one. <laughs> it, is, it is. Now uh, you'll be covering this more in depth, I suppose, on your own YouTube channel. Uh, there's a link to that in the description if you want to find out more. But basically, I guess what. What's the format of this? How are we going to go through how to become a professional wrestler? So basically, what is I've got uh you know I've got two podcasts. I kind of got one podcast that's just kind of a you know banter in between friends, and I thought, well, you know, I suppose I better do a wrestling podcast right. as well. And I kind of thought that would be the one on the side, but people started kind of resonating with it because I was just kind of I guess you've got the top level talents talking about the business. You know, you've got Jericho's podcast, Steve Austin's mm. podcast, like you know, amazing podcasts. Um, but I was thinking, what about those people who are like literally just starting out you know like just starting out in today's day and age um what is that like so i've started this podcast series how to become a pro wrestler um again i'm cheap plug uh it's on spotify and itunes and all that just if you search my name in, pod in podcast it'll be there how to become a pro wrestler and basically i just go through kind of as honestly as possible right. what it's like uh you know not just the good stuff because unfortunately the wrestling business you know what it's like there's a mm. lot of bad stuff as well so it's kind of you know things to make sure that you do um but also things to watch out for as well so basically it's, it's every week there's an hour on a different topic um going through the professional wrestling business again from a beginner's perspective because again i started at the very start of 2013 uh we're doing it you know six years now but that's still quite early and you started sort career. of was it in your mid-20s I you started yep. later than a lot of people actually yes. do yes which is again i was one of these people who was on uh you know wikipedia going how old is this person how old is this <laughs> person but they were world champion by then but it's okay because ddp didn't start to lose this <laughs> age you know i'm somewhere in the middle um i started when i was just about to turn 25 and it was very much a kind of you know i'd been putting it off for years right. and i was like it's time to go and time to do it so i really made it my life from the get-go so i can only really speak to it from that perspective um it's i know some people want to do it as a hobby mm. but what i'm trying to do in my series as well is make people realize that um really if you've got a desire to be a professional wrestler first and foremost the worst thing you can do is go to your grave with regret right. you know and the thing is if you try it and you decide it's not for you, then at least you you found out. You don't go with that regret. So I'm kind of encouraging people to dip their toes in and try it. But then if you decide it's for you, it's not really one of these things that I would recommend that you just kind of do as a hobby. It really has to be a lifestyle. And that's kind of, I'm trying to prepare people for what they're about to get into. Right, because it's know? not, I guess, I guess it's not just a case as it might seem at first on the outside of learning to wrestle, getting in shape. There's far more facets to it than than just the physical side as well. As yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I guess we'll start with the first steps to becoming a pro wrestler. What are, what are the basics you've got to have down? Well, basically, it's uh, you know, it's like anything. The 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 first choices that you make with getting into the business are really going to have a huge part in determining the wrestler that you're going to become. Um, and you know, also kind of you got to think about the thing I try and get across to people as well is that it's almost like you'll you'll probably understand this that like. The wrestling business has so many little nuances and little, you know, keywords that you might not have understood before. Right. And it, like, it takes a while to get used to kind of the wrestling lingo and kind of, you know, you really have to immerse yourself in it to kind of understand what's going on. So you'll go, I don't know if it's true with yourself as well. I know you're not a wrestler, but you've been involved in the business. Mm. You probably come at it from a perspective of you expected it to be like this. It was totally different. Exactly. Yeah. It, it blew my mind when I first saw two wrestlers call a match together. To yeah. each other. When I walked past them in the corridor, I was like, are they dancing? Like, what's going on? Yeah. And there's all these little in-jokes and languages, and, and it, 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 you learn a lot in a very short amount of time. Yeah. And I'm sure it can be quite intimidating as well. Yeah, right? definitely. Because it's, you're probably not quite prepared for some of the hostility that I'm <laughs> sure you, mu you must have gotten. It's yeah. not just, you know, unique to personalities like yourself. People need to understand, like... At the end of the day, you, you get into the business, it's the wrestling business, you've got your, your goals to achieve, 
And, you know, I, I recommend that you do that with, you know, your ethics intact and as much integrity as you can. And understand that, you know, not everyone's going to have that viewpoint. If someone feels threatened by you or that you're potentially going to take their spot, there could be a bit of sabotage going on, you know? So it's just like, it's kind of, you need to understand what you're getting yourself into. And that's just, it's like any business, you know, mm. I'm sure the entertainment business is like that. I'm sure it's like that with kind of, you know, YouTube personalities as well and stuff. But just with wrestling, it's, it can be, it's, you, you meet the best of the best and the worst of the worst. Is right, that fair? Right. Is that, yeah, is that, yeah you I know? So. so with the first steps, the main thing really for me is don't try to run before you can walk. Okay, and I'm speaking from experience. Part of the series, part of the series is reflecting on the mistakes that I made, and I kind of went in there suited and booted to the training school. The first day, I was like, "Well, I want to be a world champion." And mm. lies, you know, if you're wearing the suit, and you're like, "Okay, so the guy with the suits just walked in and right. said he's going to be world champion." You know, it's good to have those goals, but maybe some of those goals should be internalized. You know right. what I mean? For a while, I mean, it's it's fair to be. You can say, "I want to be world champion," but you know, some people might find it a bit arrogant if you go in and go, "I'm going to be world champion." Yeah, you know. So it's like if I. I mean, that is, I do have that mentality, but I think I could have gone at it with a bit more of a humble attitude, mm. you know? So really, when you first go, the, the main, when you first go to the training school is be humble and just work as hard as possible. It's again, The Rock talks about something. He says that, you know, don't look for greatness, just like consistency, consistent hard work will result in greatness, right. you know? So it's really, for me, being a pro wrestler, it's a lifestyle. It's about building habits and you're going to give, so much of your your physical health, your mental health, and your time and your money to pursue this, so you might as well do it right. Mm. So what I'm saying by that is the very first choice is where are you going to train? Mm. That is going to be the hub for you for the next few years. And it's, it's a big decision. So I guess what I'm saying is if you've got a training school that's five miles away, fantastic. But let's say that that person, the trainer, hasn't really you know, wrestled for any big companies, hasn't produced any talents that are with any major companies. And then there's training school B, which is two hours away, which you know, I, I was kind of in a situation like that. Um, I made the journey, right, you know, right. that two hour journey there and back because I went to a school that had, you know, like, John Laurinaitis was a kind of, he did a seminar there. Uh, Finn Balor did a seminar there. Like, you know, Robbie Brooks, so that I can go through mm. all the names. But I looked at that and I thought, okay, there's credibility here. Yeah. They've got huge names coming in. They produced a lot, of, a lot of the kind of top talents, both on like a Scottish and national, international level. And I was, for, for where I was located, I was like, I'm willing to make the two hour journey. I just, I speak to people and I say, you know, it's kind of how bad do you want it? And they say they want it really bad, but then they opt for the training school that's five miles away. Right. However, you know, the best training school might be five miles away. Yeah. And if it is hunky dory, but what I'm saying is when you pick a training school, do thorough research and find a trainer that has not only done great things in the business, but has also produced talents who have done great things in the business. You know, because you get people who are experts at wrestling, but not very good teachers and vice versa. It's a different, it, there's a difference, isn't there? I mean, Norman Smiley didn't particularly achieve outrageous things in his time wrestling but apparently he's a fantastic trainer so. well the thing is if you watch a lot of uh, norman smiley's like earlier work i don't think anyone can deny he he is a master I'm technician not saying, i'm not saying know? he's rubbish I'm not not saying, no, 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 no. i know but i'm just saying like obviously that was like a kind of crazy time in pro wrestling and like with the monday night wars mm. which you know right now looks like a time that could replicate that it was you know there was the demand for big characters and so i guess norman smiley had more of kind of a character-based role in that yeah. era but like before that he was known for like his technical wizardry right you know? and that never goes away so you know there was something that chavo guerrero said which is uh he said about his family he was told you know it says wrestling on the marquee. If you can wrestle, you'll always have a job. And I do feel that that is the case. Mm. And if I could be openly critical about myself, you know, which is a big part of this series, because part of the reason I'm doing the series, to be quite honest with you, is I'm not satisfied with where I am in the pro wrestling business. A lot of people will say, you know, you got to do this, you got to do that, which is great. But my goal is to be world champion. You know, I want to be the top talent. But in all honesty, Jack, my my work ethic was not reflecting that. It just wasn't. Right. So this is kind of a, 
you know, I'm kicking myself in the ass with this series right. because I'm putting my ass on the line and going, if I'm going to tell these like my fans to do this, I need to put my money where my mouth yeah, is and you do need, the same yeah. thing. So I'm trying to rebuild a lot of the patterns and behaviors that I had earlier on in my career to achieve you know, the maximum that I can now because I think, you know, there is a danger in pro wrestling that, again, when things start going well, it's, you know, they always say like it's 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 hard, it's, it's hard to get there but it's even harder to kind of to stay there, you know, but mm. so it's kind of, I did all this work to get to a, a point of, you know, relative prominence and kind of a local and national level and, you know, probably, I think there's, I, I kind of, it's difficult because I had the amateur career and the pro wrestling career. It was difficult to balance both of them. I struggled with that. Um, but now my focus is completely on pro wrestling. Mm. And I think that's scary because for me, I've always gone, well, if pro wrestling doesn't quite work out, then, you know, I've got my amateur stuff. Right. Whereas if I then go, it's a dangerous proposition to go, I'm going to put everything into this over here. Mm. And if it doesn't work out, then there is nothing else. But true world champions and those who achieve greatness tend not to operate with a safety net. Right, right. So I'm really putting my ass on the line here with this uh, because I, I kind of, I know the behaviors that I had when I started in wrestling and I can feel it coming back. The mm. passion is is greater than it's ever been. And when I say don't operate with a safety net, I will get into that in detail because I'm not saying, you know, take out a bank loan and just go train and don't do anything else and put everything on the line because that's that's not smart. When I say don't have a safety net, but let's be smart about it, you know? And that's part of the series as well. And I hope we can cover this today is I will actually talk about the logistics of basically having a job, training, the diet and all that alongside, you know, your matches and managing your career. It's a very tough thing to mm. do. So when I say don't operate without a safety net, I'm kind of talking about myself who is a professional wrestler. I can, I can do that, yeah. 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 You need to build to that point. Yeah. And that's what this series is about. It's about getting you from thinking about it to actually giving it a go mm. and then let's build world champion behaviors, mm. you know? I've, I've heard a lot of um, wrestlers, I think Pete Dunn was one of them, talk about on podcasts and interviews and stuff about how a lot of them set themselves small goals and then suddenly, yep. after a few goals you've achieved, you look back and you think, wow, I've actually come quite a long way in that sort of time. It's so true. And that's one of the problems that I've had, is it's all well and good to go, I want to be world champion. What's What are the, what are the in-between steps? Mm. <laughs> Where I've changed my thinking is... You know, I'm quite an anxious person. And again, mental health is something that, that we'll cover. I've, you know, kind of, uh, I don't want to give off the impression that, you know, it's all great all the time pursuing your dream because it's an amazing thing. But people need to realize it's the highest highs and the lowest lows. Mm. And you need to, and everything in between. And you need to really take care of your mental health and manage that. And one of the key ways to do it, like you say, is to have achievable goals now my problem is i had the big goal at the end but didn't quite know how to get there and where i've changed my thinking it's really reduced my anxieties instead of going i want to be you know icw champion by this day i want to be defiant champion by this day i want to be signed to x y and z i want to have this title by then because there's a huge element of that that you just can't control yeah the best thing that you can do is manage to the best of your ability the things that you can control 100%. Mm. So for me, what I've started doing is I'm saying to people, 2019 is not my year. It's, it's clearly other people's year. But for me, I want to put my ass on the line and say, 2019 is not my year, but 2020 will be. Because right. this year for me is not about these material goals of working here or having this title or whatever. It's about building these behaviors. So for me, what's more important is, you know, one of my goals is, you know, and it's a big goal is, I want to have one of the best natural physiques in wrestling. Right, That's okay. my goal. So right now, what I'm really focused on is, um, you know, I'm at the gym late at night, so it's just free and clear, and I can do what I want. I'm making sure my diet is on point in a way I haven't done in many, many years. And what I'm doing is I'm realizing that a huge part of my life is going to have to be in the gym. Right. And I hated the gym <laughs> with a passion. I hated it. Every lift I did, I absolutely hated it. Right. And that's, you know... You don't want to be hateful for what's going to be a huge portion of your life. So you need to learn to love what you're doing. I was going to say, how do you go about that? How do you go about reinforcing good habits and that sort of thing? So I'll give you an example of what I've done for um, weightlifting and bodybuilding and stuff like that is, again, I feel that with pro wrestling, the best way to be successful is to it's like shoot for the stars and land on the moon situation. Mm -hmm. 
I've found that if you if you ever get in pro wrestling satisfied with your spot, that's when you'll lose your spot. Yeah, it's a bad thing. Yeah, there'll be someone else that's hungry for that spot. Mm. It's the kind of thing, it's like if I, you know, if my goal is to, you know, if I build like a world champion work ethic and do everything that I can do, my goal is to be world champion. Okay, by a certain year, I might not be world champion, but I'll be intercontinental champion. Or, you know what I mean? It's You'll like be that, in a better position exactly, to achieve the next exactly, step. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So, so you have to kind of shoot for the stars and land on the moon. So with that in mind, what I've done is basically I've tried to learn to love working out and bodybuilding. So I've learned as much as I can about it, learned as much as I could about nutrition. And again, what I am finding when I try to become expert in anything is I'm noticing the same patterns. And it's literally world champions across all different disciplines. It's a ruthless execution of the basics. Right. And what I mean by that is, again, with bodybuilding, just as an example, I went on, where do you start? Greatest bodybuilder of all time. Not really into bodybuilding, but I need to get into it. I looked up, it's Arnold Schwarzenegger, and he has a 16-minute clip. Uh, it's called Training for Mass. And if you have any interest in professional wrestling, watch this clip. And he literally goes, all right, here's how I did it. Five meals a day, two hours apart, 40 grams of protein. Here's my chest workout. Here's my back workout. Here's my arms workout. Right. Here's my shoulders workout. So on and so forth. And I have just literally done what he did. Right. And then, you know, obviously, um, Arnold's kind of professional bodybuilding and stuff like that. So I've kind of gone down another route and I'm looking into uh, who are the best kind of natural bodybuilders in the world, kind of looking at what they do. And now I'm kind of really becoming passionate about it. And because I'm passionate about it, I don't hate it at the gym. Mm. I'm in there with the right mindset. And every lift, every healthy piece of food that I eat, I know I'm taking one step closer. Right. Um, we talked about the importance of uh, where you train and deciding where to train yeah. and where's the best thing. Um, now, a lot of what we talked about uh, just before we started this was managing expectations versus yeah. reality. Uh, what do you mean by that exactly? Okay. Um, so, again, it's kind of, you know, I was saying about the highest highs and the lowest lows. When people get into professional wrestling, I'll give you one of the uh, one of the expectations in your dream situation. I remember I would walk home from school and I would listen to my favorite rock songs. You know, it was <laughs> like I would listen to like Papa Roach and I'd be walking home. And I'd be imagining myself right. walking out the Titan Tron. Yeah. You know, which title would I have? Oh, I've got the world title there. And doing, yeah. doing all this. You know, imagining this in my head, right? And I'm this, you know, and when I'm a kid coming home from school, I'm thinking I'm this badass guy that just, you know, you think you're this badass that destroys everyone. And that's the thing. It's like in your head, your dream situation is you're Goldberg. Yeah. You know, that's the gimmick. Yeah. You just want to smash everyone and be the world champion, right? You want to win everything. Exactly, right. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas I got into wrestling and I realized that, again, you're, that's 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 you know that's not as a new trainee yeah. that's that's not a, a gimmick that a lot of people are going to go for so probably don't show up with the gimmick that, <laughs> uh, that you know proposing the gimmick that destroys all your opponents in, in one or two minutes you know mm. there's one bill goldberg yeah and you know that was the right gimmick for him but for me the right gimmick when i started was i was in a my gimmick was failed musician slash david brent right you know yeah, yeah, yeah. so now i'll tell you now you know no one in professional wrestling can portray a better field musician than me because I am a field musician. <laughs> you know I what I mean? I was and I, the joke there I, and I didn't want to. Yeah, you were no, like, let me do it. Let me do right, it. Right. I, because I was for 10 years and I know all those cringy moments, you know, and I know, and again, it was therapeutic. I was right. able to laugh at myself. So if I could use that, Again, because when I started in ICW, everybody's putting each other through flaming tables and tacks and I'm like, I'm going to go the complete opposite route. Like it's not the same as, but it reminds it reminded me when I first saw you in ICW of Kurt Angle. You're you're naively I'm the clean I'm a good I'm a good guy and everyone hates yeah. you and you're like, Why are you booing me? Well it started it was actually a conversation with uh, myself and Dallas. Uh, it was actually filmed for the original BBC documentary. I was originally meant to be one of the characters in it. Mm. Um but for the first of many times got cut from BBC documentaries, unfortunately. Mm. Uh, so it wasn't in the documentary. I think it would have been cool looking back, but we spoke about it, and Dallas says to me, "Early Kurt Angle, you mm -hmm. know." So that that is what we were going for. And also, I was thinking, you know, in this extreme environment, I was thinking, what happens when you put the good guy in that situation? But it's not just about you know what your gimmick is, expectations versus reality. I mean, like, don't think that you're going to show up and you know you're going to be on shows the next week, and you know everything's going to be hunky dory. Because what you need to understand is. 
before I debuted, for example, I think I waited 10 months um, and I was training almost full time, almost every day. I went into, I remember having a conversation, sorry, excuse me, sorry. I went into my work and uh, I said, you know, there's this uh, trainer, uh, he's, he's with WWE now, but he's been allowed to do uh, two weeks worth of seminars at the Source Wrestling School, which I was at the time. And I said to my work, I was like, I'm, you know, I'm just going to come out with this. I need to go do this. Right. And I know I don't have enough uh, holidays to do this, so I'm willing to do extra time. But if you need to fire me, then we're just going to need to go our separate ways because this is happening, mm -hmm. you know, in the politest way possible. And what I mean is it's a lot of people say they want to do wrestling, but a lot of people aren't willing to make the sacrifices mm -hmm. that it actually takes to be a wrestler. Like, so for me, I have fully accepted now that, now again, this is now, so I do feel I my physical shape is not where it should have been for the last few years. I'm openly putting that out there. And, you know, and again, that's why I'm, I'm doing this. I'm being totally honest. Now, I accept that food is not primarily for my enjoyment. It is literally for my profession. And that's a I have, yeah, you I have, have I have yeah. forgone food. I'm allowed to cheat meal every now and then, which I do enjoy. But food now is to take help me to take steps towards my career. So that's kind of given up. Mm -hmm. You know, again, it's like someone else that I say to people to watch is a guy called Gary V. He talks about like the v Gary Vaynerchuk. He's uh, you know, he's basically he's a motivational speaker, um, who works with you know the likes of The Rock and you know huge stars right. on their social media. But also he's an expert in work ethic. And it's like you need to watch and listen to people as to realize the level of sacrifice that it actually takes. Don't get into pro wrestling thinking it's going to be fun and games. It is going to be brutal. It is going to be the best moments of your life and the absolute worst. Trust me on that. And it's going to be everything in between. But if you put in the work, you will eventually look back and say it was worth it. But I just don't want people to get in and think that it's going to all be fun and games because it's actually very, very tough. Right. One of the things I talk about is I uh, actually helped with a training session and there was a uh, there, there was a dude who, who came in, long story short, wanted to try wrestling. Uh, and I get, but the workout, he just kind of couldn't do the, the workout. And, you know... We, we pushed him to try and get him to push through the pain and to do it because we've all had to do those those squats and those, those you know, all the push-ups and the, the, the drills and stuff like that. And it's just, it's a bit like the military, right, the training. Right. And if it's not, it kind of should be. Right. You know, it's very disciplined. It's very difficult. It's very tough. I have literally, when Robbie Brookside had a, a uh, he was taking the, the training, there's this drill, this WWE drill, um, called uh well i don't know if i should you know go into the intricacies of this okay. but long story short you're in the corner and you're basically doing high knees so it's as if you're crushing grapes you're doing high knees and you have to do this for minutes and minutes and minutes and while i was doing that my legs literally stopped working like i was i was unable to hold mm. myself up but it was a good day because i knew for the first time in my life now, I've been to the Commonwealth Games and didn't push this hard. Mm. But when it came to pro wrestling, I knew my passion was there because my mind pushed beyond what my body was willing to right, do. Right. But that is the pain. And it's good pain because it's training. But that is what you need to prepare yourself for. If you want to be if you want to be at the top level, you have to really be willing to make that sacrifice in, in all levels. You know, you're going to miss out on, you know, times with family and friends. You're going to live a, a very strange lifestyle because, you know, like for me, like uh, my, my partner has a, a day job and, and she she works for, for a, and I'm away at the weekends. Mm. Um, you know, I'm at the gym super late at night. So there'll be days where she, she works sometimes at four or five in the morning. So there'll be times where I'm just finishing up at the gym when she goes to work right. and we just completely bypass each yeah, other. Yeah. But that's the sacrifice that, you know, when you kind of get involved in a relationship that you have to kind of be honest to say, look, this is, this is the way it is, yeah. you know? So it's, it will have an impact on every aspect of your life. It will take from your life in so many different ways, mm. but if you put in the work, it will be worth it. So the next thing down on this list of topics is mental health, which mm -hmm. isn't the most obvious thing you think of when you think how to become a pro wrestler, but I'm, I'm assuming you've included it because it's an important part of it. Yeah, and it's something that, uh, to be honest with you, again, just just being uh, totally open and honest, it's, it's something that I've found uh, is something that I need to manage. You know, I think what you tend to realize when you gain it, you know, 
I'm 30 years old now, you know, I'm not, uh, I've been through a significant portion of my life and one thing that I've gained a little bit of being in the business is life experience. And you tend to learn that every, I feel every human being has their issues and, you know, nobody's perfect. They have things that they're working on and stuff like that. But I tend to find with pro wrestling, you tend to see these extremes. You know, as I say, when you go out on the weekend and you're in front of three, 4,000 people and you lift the title up or mm. you wrestle Kurt Angle and you do these amazing things, fantastic. What happens on Monday? Mm. You know, all of a sudden on Monday, watching a friend's DVD doesn't seem <laughs> quite as, you know, uh, as grand as that. And what right. happens is you get to a situation where it's, it's difficult to take joy in the little things. Mm. So if you're someone like myself who has in the past struggled with a little bit of anxiety and, you know, just being honest, depression as well, you know, it's it's uh, it's it's something that I think a lot of people struggle with on, on varying degrees. When you get into this, realize that having these highs and lows is going to have a huge effect on how you manage your mental health. Right. And for me, I'm I'm getting to a point where I'm realizing that after shows for example um it's not like nowadays like I, I don't go out after shows i tend not to to do all that stuff i don't i try to just you know do my job drive home but the difficulty is when you you've done this massive show you drive home and the next day it just feels like a void you know and you just feel flat mm. so what i've learned for me personally is after shows it's best for me to have some tasks that i need to be doing on the monday right and then i can maybe recover on the tuesday once i've kind of eased myself into that and i know it may sound like you know i'm being over the top about this but you need to trust me until you've gone out in front of a crowd like that and they're all, you know, whether it's one of the entrances or your matches and you're getting that kind of, you're, you're achieving your dream basically. Mm. And then the next day it just completely switches off. So for me, I've built a routine where once I'm done with the show, I come home and um, I know that day that I need to be, like I, I do intermittent fasting quite a lot. Right. I've learned I do not do that the day after shows. Right. It's too mentally difficult for me yeah so i'll do that on a day where i'm a bit more recovered yeah um so when i come back and I, I know i need to work out at this time i know i need to send my merch out at this time uh, i know i have a live stream at this time or a podcast at this time i'd have activities to then ease myself yeah. into ease yourself down I exactly yeah. now i'm a professional wrestler but that also comes in into play especially when you're a trainee because the thing is for me, like being a trainee was one of the most fun times in my career because it was for, before all the politics, before all the nonsense, before all the BS. Because what you got to understand is when you get into professional wrestling companies, right? If you start getting over quicker than some people feel you should be, which is what happened to me, right? Um, and don't get me wrong, it's, it's chances a weird thing. You can be in the right place at the right time. A lot of it, you put yourself into those positions. But sometimes things can happen, I guess, before you're ready, mm. you know? And that kind of rubs a lot of people the wrong way. But look at Drew, for example. I mean, he went over to WWE, and a lot of people were very, very, I guess, unfair about him because they felt like he was being given too much too soon. And then he totally reinvented himself, and, and now nobody complains about Drew, you know? I, I think, to be honest, I understand what you're saying. They're different situations. But they are, they are different yeah. situations because with Drew, for example, like, again, you're looking at a very different time in wrestling. Yes. But with Drew, he was still, you know, I don't know how tall he is, six foot, yeah. you know, six foot, yeah, whatever, yeah, yeah. jacked, looks amazing. Yeah. So, really, I look at him even back then and think he deserved to be signed right, to a major right, organization. Right, right, you know right. what I mean? Whereas, like, so let's look at myself, for example. Uh, and that's, again, the only example I can use. 2013. You got to remember, wrestling was different back back then. Now, it's you know it's completely achievable for you know there might well, by the end by the end of next year there might well be a hundred British talents signed to an right. organization or fifty or, or however many. Back then, it was you could count on one hand. Mm. You know, so I got a tryout in twenty thirteen before I'd even had a singles match. Wow, really? Yeah, That's my crazy. wait for this. My first singles match outside of the training school. All right, not even on a show. My first singles match outside of the training school uh, was at a WWE tryout in front of CM Punk, oh. Fit Finlay, William Regal, mm. and The Big Show. So you'd only been in multi-man matches before this? I debuted in one one Rumble. Wow. One Rumble. Oh, man. So you can imagine, um, yeah. but obviously, and that was, obviously I wasn't going to get, you know, I didn't get signed because, you know, I didn't. I was still basically just a, a trainee. I hadn't found myself yeah. at that point. 
It was a very daunting prospect, and I'm glad I did it. And it was one of the best years of my life because right. nothing, the first time you're backstage, you know, now that it's a profession and it's my job, that's what it is. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, I love the business, I'm passionate about it, but you'll, you'll only see Vince McMahon walk past the, for the first time once. Right, okay. You know right, what I mean? Right. There, so it's kind of like, it really just, you've been watching this this company, you've been watching this business from when you were young and it's it's been on a TV screen. Then for the, the first time, that you see these these people in real life, it really is. It, uh, it's it's an overwhelming thing. It was an amazing experience, mm. and you only get that kind of first time once. So that was yeah. I'll always treasure that tryout that I had in twenty thirteen because it was an amazing experience. Mm. But I'll look back on it and laugh because I just had like terrible ring gear. I was probably <laughs> in terrible shape, having terrible matches, and just making an embarrassment of myself. But you know, I'll look back on it fondly. Um, but basically, you got to imagine. I've been in it for a year. There's people in Scotland who've been doing it for ten right. years, ten plus years, who hadn't had a tryout by that point. Yeah. So that's going to piss a lot of people off, mm. you know. And then I got into IC my second booking was ICW. Right. You know, whereas again, a lot of people have gone for five, six years before they get into that. Now, on one hand, I would argue that well, I created my music videos. Yeah. And you know, I created this character that had a demand from the promoter. So. On that sense, in terms of you know supply and demand, mm. I deserve to be there, yeah. but not in time of ter time served. Yeah. So what I'm saying, folks, is if you are successful and you're you're an amazing trainee and people, you know, I'm not saying that's what I was. I'm just using it as an example. But if you if you do well and people want to book you, you got to remember to be on a show. You're taking a spot from somebody else. Mm. So just you got to understand that with your success, especially quick success, will come an equal amount of resentment. And if you don't have experience in the business, the first few times you grow a thick skin over time, but the first few times it's hard. It's really hard. I remember feeling so alone. I just felt, but the weird thing, I had a fire within me though. And I just, mm. I knew I didn't care who was trying to stop me from achieving my goals. Yeah. I think the problem with me is basically, and again, I'm just, this is the thing about, you know, this podcast and the podcast series I'm doing, I'll be as honest as possible. I was, I mean, you would not believe the things that had to happen for to fall into place for me to get that match with Kurt Angle. Right, right, right. So, I mean, you know, I've I've broken down a few times how it actually happened, but you know, it started with like me and Kurt Angle spoke on DM a year earlier, and he right. basically said, "If you work hard, you know, you'll get the match." A year later, we're standing across from each yeah. other in the ring. Oh, it was crazy. It was, it so, was nuts, it was man. So good. And I feel that you know what? I feel that was the first match that I had that I was like, that was you know. That was a good match. Right. I was really happy with that. Right. And don't get me wrong, Kurt Angle can have a good match with a couch. So, you know, <laughs> and I, you know, let's not make mis any mistake about it. I was the couch, but I, that was the first. I before that, I'd felt like you know the entrances were doing really well, the characters were there, the promos were there, but and you were there, but. I think it's fair to say there was a lot of, and probably rightful resentment that looked at my in-ring work at the time, because I'd only been in a few years at that point, yeah. you know? But I looked at my in-ring work at the, at the time and said, does this guy deserve a match with Kurt Angle? Right. You know, so it's like, it was hard to be in that spot at that time. Yeah. You know, it felt like, it, I felt like I was deflecting a lot, of, uh, a lot of resentment and I feel like I've since proved my worth but around that time, and again, it's, it comes with balance in the Commonwealth as well, but I just feel like, I don't know what happened, but somewhere along the way, these kind of world champion behaviors that I'd developed diminished a little bit. And I was a little bit too comfortable with, you know, my legs being a bit underdeveloped or, you know, having a bit of a gut or, you know, not doing a promo to promote every match that I'm in. You know what? What's the excuse? What is the excuse for not doing a promo for every match that you're in? You know, just... Not being lazy, but just like, I think because I had so many things going on, I would accuse myself of coasting. Okay. So right now I'm just saying, you know, this is all about refocusing and I, step by step, I'm going to do each of these things. So with this series, I'm telling people, look out for an increase in, in my match quality. Look out for better promos. Look out for my physique changing. Listen to this podcast if you've got desire to be a wrestler because I will do the steps with you along the way. Fair enough. And I think as well, we need to talk a little bit more logistically about, uh, well, you've you've phrased this as time and money is the name yep. of this section. Um, I mean, it's an important thing. Yep. <laughs> you know, you can't deny that. Um, what would your tips be? Okay, so, I mean, when you really when you really break it down, the most valuable asset 
that anyone has is their time. Mm. Because at the end of the day, you can convert time into money. You get a full-time job, you convert that into money. Time is the asset that is just, on one hand, life is short. On the other hand, life is long. And what I mean by that is life is short in the sense that don't delay. Like if you have a dream, you need to get started. And why this whole series is about encouraging people to take those first steps. Because if you can take that first step, you've had the you've been brave enough to do that then you can take the second step and you can build these behaviors it's all about that step by step progression so i'm going to figure about how can we get people started but as i'm saying time is your most valuable asset but again you need money you need cash flow they say cash is king because you need cash flow to make certain things happen. You need money to train. You need you need money to have the correct diet, to have a professional wrestling physique. You know, you need to you there is a there is a sweet spot that you need to have enough money and you need to have enough time to do what you're doing. So what I'm gonna tell you the mistakes I made, what I did is I took out uh I I I um, survived, well, I say survived, but I was unfortunately under the grasp of a Wonga loan oh, to get started with wrestling no. because I didn't want to delay. Yep. I wanted to get started, so I was really living month to month on Wonga loans. And fortunately for me, it kind of worked out in the end. But what I need the viewers to understand is because of those mistakes that I made early in 2013, I'm still paying off so the, the Wonga loans are gone, but I'm still paying off uh, money that I accrued, debt that I accrued back then. There's smarter ways to do it, yeah. is what I'm saying. So I'll give you an example. If you have a degree, that's probably going to be a useful asset. Don't feel that you have to just focus on pro wrestling and not use that. Because there are other assets that are going to forward your career. Like, for example, when I say about, like, you know, you got to be dedicated, you got to do all this. I know people who are amazing trainees who have put in all the work in the gym, all the work on this, that, and the next thing. But the promoter goes, okay, I want to book you. Um, yeah, if you can show up at six. Oh, well, I can't get there. Right. How, how can you not get there? Because I can't drive. Okay? So don't get me wrong. If you've got all these trainees that are amazing, this one's decent. But he can drive can and take it. all the top level talents to the venue and take them home at the end. And he knows how, and he or she knows how to set up and take down the ring. Guess who the promoter is going to go with? The one who the car. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. Now that sounds stupid, but get a car, be or even just be able to drive. That's where I got my first bookings from. So mm. there's all it's all fine and well to say, you know, let's get the training here, let's get the diet here. But there are certain some people can't see the forest for the trees. There are certain basics that if you have them, you are going to get booked. Look at Adam Maxted, right? Yeah. Now, I met him in 2014, and I use him as the example because again. He was someone that faced a little bit of resentment because his physique was better than anybody who was on the show when he was a trainee. And I remember when I saw him, I knew I spoke to him because I knew he was about to go through all the resentment yeah, that I'd right, gone right. through with the entrance video. Grado had the same conversation with me. Yeah. It was it's a chain. Grado <laughs> had the talk with me. I had it with Adam Maxted, and he'll have that talk with someone else. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But basically, he had a better physique than everybody else. Folks, if you have an amazing physique, a promoter can put you on a poster. You are marketable immediately. Imagine you can do that. And you can drive. You know <laughs> what you got to do is you got to take away all objection to you being booked. And part of being undeniable is taking care of those little things. But I'm, I've sidetracked a little. But let's talk about the time and the money. So what I mean is you need a way to have a source of money, right? You got to have income. Don't don't rely on your parents. Don't just rely on you know. Don't think. Don't take anything for granted. You need an income. What I would say though is if you can try to make it part time. Can you survive on part-time and do the training that you need to do and operate a car? It's very difficult, but it can be done. You know, that might mean you need to still live at home. You know, but you, but people say, but I don't want to live at home. I want to have my own place. Well, I thought you said you wanted to be a, a wrestler. Mm. You know what I mean? you got to make choices, but some people don't have the option mm. to stay at home. I was in a position in 2014 where I was working full-time, commuting, and I was doing three shows at the weekend. Mm. So that was, it was brutal. It's, yeah. But I it. did it for a year because I knew if I did it for that year, I could save enough cash to give wrestling more of a go the year after. Right. I ended up going full time when I started working with What Culture. So I did have to uh, kind of rethink things uh, financially and all that by getting rid of my job. But there comes a time and a place. If you have a degree or you have some sort of qualification, use it. 
I made the mistake at the start of going, well, I want to focus entirely on pro wrestling. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a job that is minimum wage and, uh, you know, so I don't have to worry about anything. I just go and I do my shift and then I leave. You set, you save your, your energy for, for wrestling, kind of. Which is the thought. Yes. And here's why it's wrong. Right. It couldn't be more wrong. How many, you know, you know people in minimum wage jobs, right? Yeah. I, I know people in minimum wage jobs, a lot of people that are in it. And I will tell you now, I've been in that position. I've been unemployed before. You know, I've been unemployed. I've had minimum wage jobs. I've had jobs related to my degree. And I will tell you, the hardest that I ever worked when it came to a job that wasn't wrestling was in a minimum wage job. Yeah. You will be worked way harder than you're supposed to be. You'll be taken advantage of and you kind of want to progress beyond that situation yeah. as quickly as possible. So that was my original thought. I, I had the experience of the minimum wage job and I was like, no, I need to use my degree. And it's actually easier in, trust me, I applied for hundreds of minimum wage jobs and, you know, it was just, it was so difficult to get one. I eventually did. But when I started applying for jobs that were relevant to my degree, it was way easier mm. because there's so many people going for every minimum wage yeah. job. Every place has CVs up to here, whereas if you've got a special, specialized qualification, th there's nothing wrong with having a job that you quite enjoy mm -hmm. or that you, you know, is a little bit lighter on the workload. So I ended up starting full time, but then I got to a position where I could work part time. And my job that was related to my degree, I could work three or four days a week, earning the same as I would working full time in the, in the minimum wage job to give it more time. So basically what I would say is, yeah, I talk about not operating with a safety net, but let's get yourself a cash flow that you can draw from to get wrestling gear, to go to training, to get the food that you need. Let's it's not overindulge on PlayStation games and stuff like that, you know, because we need to make choices, we need to make smart choices, and we need to make sacrifices. Your time is more valuable than buying nonsense. You know, you don't need, do you need that? Probably don't. Learn to live with a basic lifestyle. Because again, a lot of people say, Danny Cage is someone that you should look at on Twitter and on Facebook. He is in charge of the uh, one of the Future of Honor dojos over in America. Uh, I've trained with him in the past when I went over to America. Um, but he's a, a tw he, watch his social media because he, he will tell you examples of where trainees will go, I want to be a professional wrestler so bad, but uh, there's a new uh, console coming out that I want to get. Oh. So, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, I got a Nintendo Switch, but I worked up to that point. Yes. I'm just saying you need to make sacrifices in that regard. So get get to a position where you've got enough cash flow to train the way that you want to train and put the time in in the way that you want to put the time in. Um, just before we finish, there is one thing that I wanted to ask you yeah. uh, about, a specific thing about breaking into the wrestling business. Okay. It's not for my own use, just because I'm curious about it. Yep. Um, one of the things that I, I sort of, that stands out most about you is your... Charisma, your your ability to talk, your ability to sell. Thank you, right? That's put all right. Over, put me over. Um, how natural was that for you? And did you have to develop it? And what advice would you give in terms of people finding a personality in wrestling? It's a good question. Uh, for me, I could sit here and say that it came naturally because when I started wrestling, promos were my strength, the character was my strength. But the truth is. I'd been doing gigs since I was 15 years old. Right. You know what I mean? So I'd been doing those gigs and my strength at those gigs was, you know, our our music obviously never resonated with, you know, millions of people, but, uh, you know, because we, we would have made it. But one thing that I always took pride in is that we would win over the audience because I'd have banter in between songs and right. stuff like that. So I'd really, without realizing it, been working on my promos since I was 15. Right. So the truth is, it, you know, I was, a lot of people become wrestlers because they were dorks at school. Right. And I was, you know, I trust me, I was the biggest dork there was at school. You know, at the end of the day, we all graduate into agile, adult life with these issues that we had, <laughs> that we want to overcome from, from our childhood, you know, but I'm the biggest dork there is. I had to learn all of these things. None of it it came naturally to me so it was over a long period of time um, and that's the thing even if it does come naturally to you you will always find the person who's willing to put in more time the person the hardest worker will always surpass the most naturally talented right every single time fair enough well joe thank you very much for all right thank you us. that's all right um if you want to check that out again uh joe's series on how to become a pro wrestler do follow the link in the description and uh, yeah, have you got anything you wanna you wanna say? Um, no, I just I wanna say you know thanks to Cultaholic. You know it's uh, it's 
awesome to see you guys are doing well. Thank you And, you know, I appreciate you guys giving me a platform and uh, always have fun when I come down here. So I just want to say hi to the fan base as well. And it's just, it's, you know, it's, it's positive, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's just got a, a good vibe, isn't it? What a good day. And it's Valentine's Day at the time of recording as well. Uh, oh, thanks for Bloody reminding hell. me. I better, uh, better grab something <laughs> off. Better grab something off. I'm just so so focused on sacrificing for pro yeah, wrestling. You know, real life is just, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. But yeah, no, if you could download the podcast, that would be that'd be awesome. Give it a little rating as well. Uh, if you just search, I've got two podcasts. So I've got the um, the Jack's Cringing because I'm just self No, no, it's all about it. You know. uh, but I've got two uh, podcasts. I've got one that's just banter between me and friends. So that's the Joe Henry Show. Whereas if you're more interested in the pro wrestling side of things, it's how to become a pro wrestler. Just search my name in Spotify, iTunes, wherever, Google Podcasts, wherever you listen to podcasts, they're all in the same feed. So go check that out. Also, I have a, a new show super top secret show that's going to be linked to my patreon when it comes out on uh, march 1st so Ooh. please watch out for that if you could actually i'll tell you what if you could subscribe to my youtube that'd be amazing i got a, jack i've not even got three thousand subscribers go for it subscribe to joe's youtube channel youtube.com forward slash joe hendry great stuff uh thanks very much <laughs> for watching this if you want to follow our patreon as well that's patreon.com forward slash cultaholic uh i'm on twitter at jack the jobber if you want to you want to yeah, do it's uh, my twitter is joe s hendry and uh, my instagram is joe hendry the instagram needs some love as well okay how many followers you got on instagram yeah about eight thousand. Oh, all right I th- yeah that's kind of i'm in that sort of yeah i thought you'd have loads no i don't really focus I, i'm no. too much on twitter yeah. i know i'm a twitter yeah. guy as well i get twitter i just you can write on twitter you can't write on instagram I know. it's just I pictures know. it's bollocks um Thanks very much for watching, and don't forget, of course, to join us.